Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and these are my end of year and end of decade thoughts. Um, I, I like to record these things to supplement the occasional blogging that I do and the occasional, much more occasional, I, I guess actually that, that means, yeah, much less frequent YouTube videos that I do, although neither of them are super frequent, but just marking the passage of time is, uh, I think it's nice to have something to look back on uh, later in life or for others to look back on and see what kind of a person one was at a certain point in time, what one was thinking about. And at the end of 2019, I know that uh, technically, well, I mean, it's not technically, it's, it's actually the way that we count time is from the year one, because by the way that we typically, in the Western calendar, at least historically, uh, began our time frame, it does have some historical uh, roots in what used to be a strong uh, Christian belief in Western societies. And even though that has significantly faded, uh, we, we kept the timeline because there really isn't a, there isn't an objective way to measure time. And uh, and so there was little impetus to change uh, to, to something else, because what would that something else be? And so even though we refer to these things as CE versus uh, 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 well, uh, Common Era, while in previous times we refer to these things as, uh, as uh, AD, uh, Anti-Dominium uh, dominium or something like that, uh, after the the birth of of Jesus, or at least the belief birth, because even their theologists and people who look at the calendars, they they now think that uh, the historical uh, figure probably wasn't born uh, at at the at the time that begins our traditional calendar. And there have been a lot of calendar shifts since, uh, and I might be wandering off into the uh, into the uh, into the forest here from what I was meaning to express. Um, technically, the coming decade starts in 2021, but nonetheless, I believe that we pretty much, uh, we can we consider the, the zero at the end of this coming year to mark a decade transition better. And that's fine. Uh, I'm willing to go along with that. I mean, the entire process of looking back over a year or even a decade involves diving into some of these um, fairly arbitrary ways to mark time, and the notion of correctness doesn't exactly apply. Uh, and that even if, well, yeah, that's, that's probably all that really needs to be said about that. Um, and and I, I do this twice a year, and I think probably a lot of people do. People tend to look back on their birthdays uh, it, to, to think about how their life has changed and, uh, and sometimes how society has changed. Um, the fact that this is more of a shared transition for everybody marks, marks this as being maybe a little bit more about society at large. Like where were we? Uh, where were we, ten years ago? But where was society ten years ago? And what were the things that were big in in our life then that aren't big now, and vice versa? Uh, what are concerns going forward? Sometimes people make New Year's resolutions, and I I don't think that that's particularly. Uh, I don't think of it as harmful. Uh, I. I think it's it's kind of nice to live your life actively uh to to steer it uh as part of part of way of being able to have nice things to look back on later in your life and for uh, for your family to look back on and fr uh, potential friends or just people who are curious about you at at some point in the future and so I'm not going to shy away from that despite the arbitrary nature of a lot of um a lot of the details. So, where was I 
about 10 years ago. To my recollection, I think I was still living in Pittsburgh. And a lot of some of the, the social ties that I had from that era, I mean, most of them were still in place. Uh, I, I never have been a particularly socially active person, but I had, as far as I remembered, a few groups of people that I knew. Uh, there was a group called the Zets that was a social group that was maybe, in, uh, it was fading. Um, it, uh, it's a, those of us who were around when I left P uh, Pittsburgh, we hadn't met for a while. Uh, near the beginning of my, maybe near the middle of my time in Pittsburgh, I was meeting about once uh, once a week with them uh, for pizza at a place near Pitt's campus. Uh, but the group had had a long history before most or even any of the people who were regularly showing up uh, uh, had been there. And it was just a group of mostly fairly geeky people. Uh, there was a kind of cosmo uh, cosmopolitan vibe uh, to the group, and uh, most of us had social ties to various other parts of the group um, outside of the group itself, which was nice. Um, I had a, a small group of people that I regularly gamed with and hung out with back then. Um, but but Zets itself was was kind of, uh, it was fading uh, by that time by by ten years ago. Uh, I had some ties to a number of undergrad and grad students at uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and I hadn't yet um, hadn't yet hit the events that led me to uh, get get a bump from some of the so uh, bump out of some of the social uh, social traditions of that group and organizations. That was a fairly painful divide for me. Um, and, uh, it was over politics and certain issues where, uh, the, uh, the, the people in the group had adopted a fairly progressive, uh, consensus on certain issues that I had not, uh, and, uh, disagreements on how to speak, uh, uh, on certain topics were, uh, they were at in, uh, at the center of uh, of our disagreement, which happened on IRC. And uh, since then, I've pretty much cut most of uh, most, maybe all of my ties uh, with the group at that time. Ten years ago, I was near the end of my stay in Pittsburgh. I don't think I had left yet for Philadelphia, although it was that time wasn't too far off and it's possible that i'm misremembering and i already was in philadelphia um i think google plus was still around live journal was also uh fading in importance uh, to me uh, because i found plus to be better environment and live journal uh either was or soon would be uh, bought by a Russian corporation, and I didn't trust some of the uh, some of the social controls that they were beginning to hint that they would uh, implement in order to comply with Russian law. <clears throat> and so it was somewhere around uh, around ten years ago that I, I took this step uh, to leave Pittsburgh and follow what looked like a uh, a promising romance. And I, I don't have a lot of uh, bitterness uh, towards the, the people involved. There were some details of how that worked out that I regret. There were some ways in which I felt uh, duped. But by and large, I, I think a lot of social ties are messy and a lot of the time, people don't really know what they want in romance, and I think we have to accept that it doesn't make sense to, to hold grudges over those things. And there were certain ways in which I was immature or otherwise didn't think things through. Maybe when certain misunderstandings were corrected, I should have backed off, and I didn't. Uh, it was 
hard for me and I had my reasons for most of the things that I did but but yeah you collect these regrets in life it's it's just part of engaging in that sphere and admittedly in the last 10 years I haven't really um haven't really engaged in much uh much of the way of that sphere since after that relationship fell apart I just I got tired and depressed uh on relationships I didn't swear off of them but they've come along pretty uh the possibility of them has come along pretty rarely for me because I'm not the easiest person to get along with I'm not very often attracted to people and when I am it's often to people who are either unavailable or who are not very attracted to people like me and and shifting politics in the United States has made this harder as I've never been one to move my positions on things unless I'm convinced of the new position. So social pressure doesn't really work on me that way. Uh, I know who I am. I know what I believe in. And it's not that I'm completely static, but I need a reason beyond wanting to be liked to move my positions. And I think as, general, uh, as people generally get older, they find themselves... Uh, challenged by new norms that they never signed on to and they can either sign on to them uh, or or they can suffer from potentially having some taboo perspectives and I think I've done this at least because politically I see myself as a liberal and I well I don't hang out exclusively with liberal people I find myself probably most in theory compatible with liberal people except for those taboos and those taboos are pretty big difficulties to navigate and they've increased in number as as time has gone uh, gone on so so it's it's hard to deal uh with that but uh, i still don't intend to move my perspectives on on things around uh unless i'm convinced of new perspectives and i'll uh, I think in order to respect myself, uh, I need, I need to uh, keep this perspective, uh, keep this approach uh, t uh, to issues. Anyhow, um, so I've been living in New York for most of the last ten years, and I've lived in a variety of places. Uh, I've had at various times other groups of friends come and go or at least groups of people that I know, I still have this general tendency in, uh, in life of walking away from circles of friends when things don't seem to work out. And this is something that I've, I've, it's a pretty dominant theme in my life. I get close to people for a while and then some issues come up and eventually I leave. Uh, just when I see that things aren't moving my way. I I don't know if if I uh, if I usually leave when things are salvageable or maybe even not particularly damaged uh, because uh, it's always been just it's felt tiring for me to be around people and I like it I uh, but I need to have a lot of control over when when it uh when i'm maintaining social obligations and when i can step away and eventually just the pressure builds up when i'm around people uh particularly when uh when there's big differences in perspective that lead to lead to my stepping on taboos or them stepping on my taboos things like that but just in general, there's always a certain tension that builds up, and I wonder if that's led me to step away from things when I really shouldn't have. It's it, you never you never really get answers to these things in life, or at least it's hard to get them without somebody who knows you really, really well. And because I haven't kept people around to do that, I don't really have anybody who could offer me that perspective. I mean, people can always offer opinions, but they wouldn't necessarily be well founded, and I I don't think I could trust them unless somebody actually has been with me most of the way in life. And so that's that's unfortunate. Um, moving to New York, I did some of it for some of the wrong reasons. 
and uh, imagining that there would be people out here that I would easily find uh, that would help me build a circle of friends. The problem really always has been within me and how I relate to other people. And a change in, in locations maybe gave me a fresh start, but it didn't uh, didn't fix, uh, it didn't actually make it easier long term to, to relate to people. And there were also maybe a f uh, there were a few people who I moved here to hopefully get to know better and to have them in my life. And they didn't stick around. In fact, somebody who I was hoping to get to know, they actually they ended up moving uh, maybe a month before I arrived and I didn't know it. And so I never actually got to know them beyond uh, beyond the, sh uh, the sh uh, shallow level. And that kind of sucked. But it was not a realistic thing to uh, to want to begin with. And uh, so, but New York has been good for me in a lot of ways. It's easy to find intellectual stimulation. There are a lot of groups for a lot of things. I dip my toe into a lot of waters and I'm glad I had that opportunity. And at least for now, I expect I'll be staying in New York and, until something more interesting comes along. Um, could be a relationship, could be, uh, could be if I ever d decide that I want something very different from the kind of work I'm doing now, maybe I'll decide to change city and job at the same time. But right now, well, so 10 years ago when I left Pittsburgh, I moved to Philadelphia and for those nine months, I just lived on my savings, which was interesting. I was wondering what it would be like. And it was kind of a mini midlife retirement. And it was nice. I explored a lot of ideas. It, it was a creative time in my life. I organized some of the creative uh, adventures that, that I had, stories that grew big in my mind that I wanted to work out the details of. A few of these I put on the internet. A lot of them just stayed inside the documents that I use to work these things out or, or wikis that I use where I'm, I'm the only person who, who posts to them. Uh, wikis that I ran on, on a desktop or a laptop. Um, and that was nice, but eventually I was watching my savings dwindle and the relationship that I followed to Philadelphia didn't work out. So I moved to New York City and uh, in order to do that, I did part-time work for a little while uh, at a finance company. And uh, eventually I ended up uh, meeting through Nylug some people who were looking for a, um, a systems programmer to help debug uh, and uh, to help with scaling of a VPN service. So I worked for them for a while. And unfortunately, I I learned that under certain circumstances, uh, when I'm put under enough stress, I can snap and be be a douche to people. And I wasn't very kind to my uh, to my coworkers after certain stresses arose, and that job soured, and I made mistakes. Uh, I've since apologized for them. There are, uh, there are regrets that I have for that period of time. Later on, I, I moved to a company called uh, MongoDB, where I worked for about two years. And it was an interesting place to work. There were some big positives, some big negatives. I met a, uh, met a lot of pretty good uh, people there, um, got certain frustrations, but uh, it was, in general, I got, uh, got a lot of good things out of the experience. And I think on balance, they uh, outweigh, probably well outweigh the, the negatives. Although there were some negatives relating to how the company was managed that I was very frustrated by. Um, after, uh, after that, I moved to Dropbox and worked there uh, for about two years. And Dropbox was a, a very different place to work. Um, and I liked... There's a lot to like about Dropbox. I had certain frustrations relating to my manager, 
But at Dropbox, the upper management I thought was great, and a lot of the mid-level management was also great. Uh, there were a lot of interesting ideas that I got to play with, and I thought a lot about infrastructure at an even larger scale than I saw at Mongo. And uh, I met a lot of really great engineers there. And there's there's a lot of people with both companies uh, that I still really miss. And there's a sense of adventure that I, I also really miss with those companies. With neither of them, I do I really use the product a lot because being a fairly self-sufficient Linux person who can build infrastructure as needed, there's just uh, there's not a lot of of pull for pe uh, people like me to to use those solutions, except for a, a few things uh, in which they're they're both good uh, solutions. Although Mongo gave up on the open source thing uh, some time back, so their appeal is a lot less for me now than I uh, than the uh, than there was at least the the kind of this is a worthwhile thing that aids open source that that is gone now and I have a certain amount of resentment for that shift in the product license but but the the people that I worked with in general in both companies were were good and with a few exceptions I would love to work with any of them again um, after leaving Dropbox I moved to a private research foundation uh, which is where I am now it's nice to be in academia again uh, a lot of the things that I was frustrated with 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 both companies uh, are are not present in academia academia has its own faults but they're generally not frustrating faults not actively frustrating faults um, <clears throat> like academia is, uh, is slow moving. Sometimes they adopt technology choices that feel strange from an industry perspective. But but uh, but just a lot of the management culture issues are not there in academia because people are not organized around the same things that they are in industry. So I'm happy with the job uh, that I have now. I really love the research topics that I'm working on. I love working with probably the the most curious and intelligent people that I've uh, that I've worked with since leaving Carnegie Mellon. Um, it's it's a good setup, and I I've maintained some of the 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 university ties through uh, surprisingly through ties to Pitt. And Pitt is not a, a place, uh, it's not a university where I ever took classes. Uh, it's a university that nonetheless I interacted with moderately when, I, uh, when, work, uh, when, at, Carnegie, uh, when at Carnegie Mellon. But my, uh, I, I donate to Pitt uh, at a certain level, L uh, in a way, uh, largely because I started doing to it, uh, I started donating through because a friend of mine ended up as a professor at Pitt, and I was uh, helping uh, him fund something. And Pitt reaches out to people that donate uh, to them, and they, I, because I spent ten years in Pittsburgh, I, I feel a lot more of a tie to Pittsburgh than I do to Columbus, Ohio, or my actual alma mater. Uh, Ohio State and I don't feel that Carnegie Mellon really needs my money in the same way that Pitt does as a as a public school and because I I started doing it I kept on doing it and I'm still donate uh, donating to Pitt um, and there's there's a lot of good stuff though that people generally should be willing to do for uh, there's a there's a lot of wor worthy projects that universities have that people should be willing to fund. And it doesn't really matter whether it's the university that they went to or not. It's just education is an important thing. And universities are under threat to, uh, to a large extent because of anti-intellectualism in the United States. And universities have been a competitive strength for the United States for a long time. And it's not something that's kind of a rah-rah nationalism kind of thing. It's more a education is important kind of thing. And we should be helping the world through helping our, our local universities.
uh, I'm using the term locally a little bit uh, in a stretched manner there. So what have I seen over the last 10 years? I think I've seen, I've come to a, a new understanding of certain tech companies. And some of this is the companies themselves have changed. And some of this is just as I've gotten older, I've underst uh, I understand a little bit more about how things fit together in society. And I, I'm less trusting of, of big tech. Not that I was ever particularly highly trusting of it, but I'm significantly less trusting of it now than I was 10 years ago. Um, I've seen a lot of activism in the, the worker culture and a lot of uh, tech companies, and I'm pretty hostile to the level of politi uh, political, the, the level of political homogeny in big tech companies. I really worry about how strong it is and how much uh, it's become uh, excessively concentrated around uh, the progressive form of liberalism. Uh, naturally, as a non-progressive liberal, uh, I, I notice this contrast more than probably a lot of people would. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Fortunately, I, th I think as tech companies get older, they figure, they figure out that these monocultures that they've built are not serving them well. And we're seeing a lot of shifts inside of companies like Google, where they're realizing that the worker activism that's ruled them is not serving them well. And it ends up being it ends up stepping in the way of their business needs, but it also steps in the way of uh, their ability to be fair to people who don't share those politics. And so I'm hoping that uh, that we'll see this kind of uh, worker activism, at least specifically progressive worker activism, uh, see it expunged from those companies, not expunging people, but not drawing policies uh, directly from their playbook. And um, one of the other things, uh, one of the other trends that I've seen which continues to worry me, what, uh, probably about 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, I was worried about postmodernism as a uh, as a dominant force thre uh, threatening free speech in the name of uh, harmony between uh, different faiths and things like that. And that didn't come to pass, but instead uh, progressivism, uh, in particular the, the shift towards uh, avoiding offense, uh, or the, the shift towards perceiving injustice as being primarily about what identity you have and what grievances those identities might claim against broader society, that kind of social shaping has instead come to dominate uh, or at least be, uh, be dangerously strong in today's society. Uh, that, that, that has replaced the, the postmodernist worry that I had, the worry about uh, woke progressivism. And I know that these terms are not monolithic. There are a number of different perspectives that they cover, but I find most of them threatening. Uh, and I worry about, uh, I now worry that the, that the new moralists uh, that, that come from that camp are doing a lot of damage to, um, to pluralism in society. And I'm hoping that just like society learned how to uh, how to deal with um, libertarianism and how it uh, learned to deal with postmodernism, I hope that we can learn to combat that those voices without giving up on the areas of legitimate critique 
that right now they've claimed as their exclusive domain to, uh, because some of these cr critiques are important uh, to lay and some of them are important to consider but by and large they've become associated with uh with Foucault uh and that is a is something that we need to break and we we need to develop to redevelop the the universalist uh spirit uh while while examining the things that really should be examined uh that uh, that have been neglected over time that have lent strength to uh to this movement a strength that i believe to be undeserved um so there's that but there's also a backlash against technocracy which i've come to take as a, a as a flag that i'm waving uh, a belief in expertise uh and its importance in society and a belief that un unfortunately a lot of good policy is not fun it's not inspiring uh but it nonetheless is the best policy uh and uh and that we should respect education we should ex uh respect expertise that comes after people get the highest level of education available on the relevant topics uh and has them working in uh in the field and having scholarly review of their ideas you see a lot of this in foreign affairs journals uh and a belief that those that expertise best guides us to, uh, towards the best results in most domains of life and there are certain domains of life where there are uh what i would consider false fields and false expertise uh done by by activists uh again often the uh the the uh the progressive political voices that dominate certain social studies fields uh gender studies and various ethnicity studies those i consider false fields and their expertise doesn't mean anything but in in most uh in most academic fields uh expertise means everything uh it it doesn't necessarily mean that people have to consider these for the values that they want pursued but given a certain set of values expertise is usually the best way to find to either get directly there or to find a reasonable compromise with other values that society holds and i think people have have lost their willingness to listen to experts oftentimes this is through uh a lack of civics education uh there are certain malign media companies uh fox has uh, often played this role and uh oann has has played this uh, uh this role as well in more recent times but there there may have been things that people uh that existing institutions have overlooked in terms of how they communicate what they're doing why they want things to the general public and they could do better and they should do better and we've uh there are also certain there there's a dangerous extent to which uh human rights has replaced uh democratic uh democratic norms and people have decided not to discuss things because rights experts have have put down a flag on certain topics and declared certain things in uh inequivocably uh correct and we're not allowed to question those things and that produces a backlash so some of the some of this backlash is deserved against expertise because we've allowed certain topics to be outside the scope of democracy and that rightly uh makes people angry and uh we need to stop doing that but also uh in areas where there is objective truth there's been under communication and there's been interference from uh from political actors who uh who are no uh no longer willing to play by uh the rules of reasonable pluralism and evidence and we need to find ways to stop doing that as well and that's hard and i don't have the answers to how to fix those problems 
uh, but they're probably the most pressing issues of the day. How can we restore technocratic rule in areas that have objective truth? And how can we back away from technocratic rule in areas that don't? And for the areas that involve a, a blend, how do we appropriately bring society's uh, values uh, in, uh, into the questions that we ask and the solutions that we pick without making it a, without allowing the passions to pull us entirely away from uh, objective uh, truth. And so these are, these are worrying questions. And if we don't get this right, then a lot of the high functioning potential that we have will be squandered and we'll adopt really bad policies that feel good uh, and we'll adopt politicians that are not good bureaucrats and instead politicians that we can believe in and we'll have a cycle where they promise impossible things they can't deliver or worse they lie and convince people that they delivered things that they never did and we wander ever further from good policy because uh, technocracy is significantly about the belief that good policy rather than uh, good feelings uh, deliver us good results. Um, so what else have we seen in the last 10 years? Um, I've seen I've seen social networks rise and fall, although usually uh, like if you step back another 10 years, things were a lot more formative uh, and you saw social networks uh, rise and fall a lot uh, in from 2000 to 2010. And there's a lot of uh, companies and services that are no longer around. From 2010 to 2020, the numbers are fewer, but there are still a, a lot of them. And every time you see these things rise and fall, you see the social ties that were made on them disappear and that's painful that's also happens on every mmo and it's something that's probably understudied there there were some games that i i played uh some mmos where i really got to know people well over years and i no longer play them and i i miss the people uh that that i used to know through those services and some of them can easily track them down and they've moved on to other things some of them they're just not particularly prominent people and uh and you lose track of them and they're just gone there's a lot of people from my pittsburgh era and before that my columbus ohio era where i wouldn't even know where to begin with how to reach out to them and that's unfortunate and uh i guess uh, 2010, uh, 2010 to 2020 in general has been a period of settling into New York and maybe not really uh, finding easy ways to fix things in my personal life. Uh, and that, that, that sucks. But uh, I guess... Uh, I I liked I liked what I saw in the two terms of Obama's presidency. There were some areas of his policy where I was very frustrated, uh, mostly uh, mostly foreign policy. Um, I did not like how uh, Syria and uh, how how the Syria policy worked out. Uh, I find that very frustrating, and I and I think that a lot of the immigration issues that have led to a big backlash uh, in Europe have stemmed from that. <clears throat> uh, and with Trump's presidency, I see it as little more than a complete disaster uh, for most areas of function in government. Uh, and it's brought out a lot of the the worst in American society. It's brought out incredibly bad policies. And unfortunately, whenever you have a, uh, a president uh, for for either side of American 
um, politics, people rally around them uh, uh, for good or for worse, uh, for, uh, for better or for worse. And they come to accept basically whatever they do and their views get moved because they were never really that solid to begin with. And so people follow whatever their, uh, their most recent president leads them into. And this is dangerous. It's long been a fault of our democracy, but when you have somebody who is uh, as bad of a leader as Trump, uh, he pulls out the worst in his half of society. And it remains to be seen whether this will be a long-term trend. And also, just like in that old movie, The Dark Crystal, what happens to one side of society is mirrored in the other. And we see with the with radical uh, populist shifts on the right, we see some of those same shifts on the left. Uh, and, and people become less vested in democracy, uh, democracy itself because they, they feel that they no longer have that much to lose uh, when the system screws them. Uh, long enough. And this is a really dangerous situation for any democracy to be in. And we we see this happening in a number of other countries across the world. Uh, Modi is doing terrible things to India. Russia has never had this long tradition of good leadership. And Putin is unfortunately is, uh, I think he's one of the most negative forces in the world right now because of his uh, successful undermining of, uh, of de uh, democratic norms and the international order. And we can no longer trust that large nations won't carve off uh, portions of smaller nations. And he's done a lot to uh, because because Russia has by and large accepted that it's not trying to be a pluralist country, it's done a lot to undermine pluralism across the world, um, and so that's that's really frustrating. I wonder if we're in the be if if we're in the uh, beginning stages of another political realignment in the United States, or if we're in the beginning of a decline of the effectiveness uh, of uh, of the uh, of the United States, and we'll, we'll have to see the long term effects. It'll probably depend a lot on who the next few presidents are, uh, but uh, there's a lot to worry about. And I know that there are people like uh, Stephen Pinker who are arguing that by the numbers, we're actually doing better than we ever have. But these these trends, these uh, terrible leaders that we're seeing across the world, uh, I think we have to be concerned at these things and that numbers do not tell the whole story. And it's possible also that those numbers are cherry picked. Uh, do they cover press freedom? Do they cover uh, regular shifts of power and trust of the media and trustworthiness of international norms? Uh, those are the longer term markers of how well the world is doing. And I don't think we're doing particularly well by them. Um, so let's let's bend this a little bit back towards uh, uh, back towards what I'm hoping to get out of the next year and the next 10 years. Um, I'm 40 now. And uh, or am I 41? I really I'm, I'm not really keeping great track of that. Uh, but, uh, I'm, I'm hoping in the next, in the next year and over the next decade to get more in the habit of sharing my creative efforts. Um, I'm hoping to, uh, uh, to, to do more in terms of, I've been, I've been doing a little bit less creatively than I probably should be, but I've definitely not been sharing uh, much or any of the stuff that I've been working on for a while. I've fallen out of that habit, and I should get back into it uh, at least significantly because that habit also inspires me to create more. And um, 
and so I I think I'm going to want to start back up the the web comic. Uh, actually, maybe more than one of them, because uh, it's never been just one. But I also should uh, should start. I I should be blogging more. There's just there's a lot that I should be doing. Uh, and uh, and I, hopefully I will be doing. And I. I need to find ways to build social ties uh, with people before I've known them long enough that they're likely leaving the area. Uh, because now there's a, a bunch of people where I'm, I've slowly built that comfort, but a lot of them are, are heading out. They're figuring out what's next in their life. And the, that it takes me a year or two to really get comfortable with people, that just doesn't work in a modern, fast-paced world. Maybe if I were living in a slower-paced city, that would work out better, but there, there's less variety to, to pull from. And uh, yes, yeah, so I need to, to get more people in my life and keep more people in my life, as difficult as that often is for me. Um, and I, I should be I, I've stopped drawing, and I should get back into that. I did pick up a, a nice uh, keyboard, and I've been playing that occasionally. I should probably get some goals and pursue them. And maybe I should brush up on some foreign languages and uh, join one of the classes that are available. That would be another way to meet people. I, I, I should find ways to meet more people just to give myself the opportunity to to keep them in my life. And one of the things I'm really thankful for uh, is that my cats are still with me and they're both very old. And I, I'm uh, always a little bit surprised that they're still with me uh, at this, uh, this, this far on from when I got them. But I'm very grateful, uh, they, they make messes they uh, they they're not always super healthy, but they're still around, and it's it's been a really long time, and I'm glad for that, uh, because they've been just they're 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 there to cuddle with me as I go to sleep every night, uh, and there's something to care for, and I I really I like having something to care for, um, and I've. Yeah, so I, th I think that those are, it's probably the, the, a good close for, uh, for 2019 and the 2010s. And, uh, hopefully the 2020s will be, will be good to me. So, uh, that's all. And any, I guess I, I am open to anybody who work uh, who, who wants to work on creative things, if we get along well and if we have ideas, uh, just let, uh, reach out to me, send me an email, let me know in the comments, something like that. Um, be fun to do some kind of skits or work on comics or something like that. I, I think that that kind of creative, uh, that kind of creative habit would, would do, uh, do me well. And maybe I should be actively reaching out to people for that, uh, too. Um, but yeah, here's here's to a more creative next decade. Uh, if I if I end up actually meeting somebody who uh, would be great for a relationship or a few people, uh, um, oh, uh, I mean, I don't want relationships with multiple people at once and ideally would have a nice long term one. It'd be great if I just met the one and somebody who I would be happy with for the rest of my life. But if not that. Uh, a number of attempts at that wouldn't be uh, too bad. But yeah, here's to a more social, more creative uh, next 10 years for me. And hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, society will be moving in better ways, both in the, in the United States and the world uh, in the decade to come. Hopefully we'll learn our lesson from a lot of the, the mistakes we make and do better. So that's what I've got to say. Uh, so long and Happy New Year.